Good evening, everybody. Brian Newbert here from GoldenBlack.com, uh, live here once again in Mackey Arena. This time, following uh, Purdue's 74 to 69 loss, you don't see those very often around here in this building. Uh, to number 23, Wisconsin. Obviously, uh, a disappointing outcome for Purdue. A surprising outcome. Um, as I'll spend the next 10 to 12 minutes here discussing uh, in our post-game wrap video brought to you by our friends at the Purdue Club Hotel and the 811 Restaurant. Thank you to them for their support. I've spent the last few days and probably long before that writing about how much things change when a team gets into Big Ten play. Big Ten play is very different than non-conference play. Big Ten play is very different than conference play in a lot of other conferences. It is a very uniquely <clears throat> consistent style of basketball that's been played since the dinosaurs ruled the earth. Um, it is built on many, many bedrock basketball values, some of which include toughness, defensive buy-in, decision-making, all the stuff that's not nearly as fun as windmill dunks and mixtapes, but has won a lot of people a lot of basketball games over many, many, many years in this league. Um, Purdue was a great team in non-conference play. 12-0 in non-conference play, got up to number one in the country, finished non-conference play number three in the country. Purdue it does not yet look like a great Big Ten team, and there is a difference. Uh, because when you run through a lot of those traditional values, basketball values I just mentioned, um, the ones that have sort of defined this league again since, since the dinosaurs roamed the earth, the dinosaurs of course being Gene Cady, Lou Henson, Judd Heathcote, and on down the line, Bobby Knight, etc. Physicality. I have to walk something back that I wrote yesterday because it makes me look like a jackass right now. I thought the increased physicality that comes with Big Ten basketball would play to produce strengths um, more so than in non-conference play when you're playing small ball much more and I could not have looked more wrong uh, today especially in the first half because Purdue's physical advantages didn't show up until it was pretty deep into this game pretty deep into the second half actually um, Zach Eady himself will tell you he was not tough enough Purdue across the board was not tough enough. They did not get anything out of the post until deep into this game, and that has to be Purdue's starting point. Physicality around the basket, defensive rebounding has got to be better than it's been the last two games. I know Wisconsin's um, 12 second chance points don't seem like all that much, but that kept Wisconsin ahead of Purdue in the first half, and this game ending up as close as it did all of that stuff mattered. Purdue was was either defending really well in the first half against Wisconsin, or Wisconsin was bad offensively, one or the other, probably a combination thereof. Um, but those second chances really helped buoy, B-U-O-Y, Wisconsin, um, not Boo Booey uh, from Northwestern, Booey, like it's floating in the water. Um, it really helped stabilize Wisconsin when Wisconsin was struggling to score. In the second half, Purdue, you know, did not defend nearly as well as it as it needed to. Um, discipline is another, you know, long-standing bedrock of of Big Ten play, and Purdue's, you know, um, ability to take care of the basketball, ability to make good decisions in key moments, you know, let it down some uh, here uh, against Wisconsin. Historically, one of the bedrock, one of the gold standards in the Big Ten, if not college basketball, for disciplined play. Uh, they will put you to sleep if you give them the chance. Um, Purdue had, I don't know how many. Um, Isaiah Thompson had one pick six he allowed right before the half, which was an absolute disaster because Purdue was rolling at that time. Eric Hunter had one in the second half. Purdue's guards just, you know, were not strong enough with the ball. Uh, you know, Purdue's Purdue's decision-making at times, you know, left a little bit to be desired. Discipline, this was not Purdue's most, most disciplined um, game. Toughness, obviously, um, you know, kind of falls in line with what I mentioned before about physicality. I did not think, you know, Purdue was the tougher of these two teams. I don't know anybody who, watching the game would have 
disagreed with that. Um, you know, poise, I thought, again, you know, Purdue needed to be stronger with the ball. They needed to make better decisions, you know, things like that at times. Their offensive execution, uh, you know, really could have been better um, at times as well against the most physical defense I think they're going to see at this point. I, I thought their guards, you know, were affected by the physicality of Wisconsin, both on and off the ball. Um, and what Wisconsin did defensively should have surprised no one because Wisconsin's been doing this since – since I was born, uh, at least. Um, no, that's not accurate. Dick Bennett was there in the 90s, all the way back to the 90s. Wisconsin stunk when I was born. Uh, they've come a long way uh, in the last 44 years. Anyway, defensive-mindedness is something that a lot of Big Ten teams have won a lot of games, you know, hanging their hopes on. And, you know, Purdue has not become that team yet and that is where you know Purdue's got a really existential crisis on its hands here because I've mentioned this before that there has been some serious buy-in lacking uh, on Purdue's part in terms of being a team that can win with defense that can just be be good enough on defense um, to win the sort of games they're going to need to have the need to win to have the sort of season they want to have. Um, it's just not there. And I thought the Butler game looked to me like a uh, looked to me like a turning point because I know Butler was shorthanded and all that stuff, but Purdue played with much more of an edge from a defensive perspective than I, I remember seeing before that. And I thought the last two games was just Purdue being bored and Purdue coasting. Maybe I was just kind of rationalizing my own take. Maybe I was reverse engineering what I thought I saw in terms of that Butler game. But Purdue has a long way to go here from a defensive perspective. This is not the Purdue team you have historically uh, seen roaming these, um, roaming this facility because they're just not that team. Um, they've not grown into it. I don't know if they're necessarily – moving in a great direction in that regard either and it's it's January as I said before it is go time and Purdue you know didn't look like all that much better a defensive team today than they did uh, you know the last few weeks and this was the third player since the start of December to get at least 29 points on Purdue Johnny Davis obviously being that guy he was unreal tonight Purdue had no answer for him and it used to be where at Purdue where Purdue normally could build a defensive game plan around one player or a player or one signature star, whatever it might be, and then either take him out or at least make him inefficient and make the other people on the floor beat them. And that's just not something that's clicked with Purdue yet uh, here because they got roasted by Ron Harper. They got roasted by Ty Gordon uh, from Nichols, even though that didn't matter all that much. Game conditions are kind of what they are in a game like that. And then Johnny Davis. It's not just that they're getting these gigantic numbers, but when the game's on the line at the end and you need a stop, you cannot stop that player. Ron Harper, you know, was the classic example at Rutgers, and I'm not talking about the half-court shot. I'm talking about the stuff that came before that. Um, Johnny Davis today, Purdue had just simply no answer for a kid who looks like an unbelievable player. I can't believe how good that kid has gotten so fast. Um, he's not going to be there very long. Very similar to Jaden Ivey uh, in the sense that he just a guy who kind of, kind of, I don't want to say Jaden Ivey played a secondary role for Purdue last season because he didn't, but you know a guy who didn't get a whole lot of fanfare as a freshman, who now all of a sudden ha has blown up into one of the best players in the country. The Big Ten's got a lot of great sophomores: Keegan Murray, Jaden Ivey, Zach Eady, and uh, and Johnny Davis, obviously. Um, but Purdue had no answer for him. He made some unbelievable shots, some really tough clutch shots but Purdue just couldn't just had no answer for him and it used to not be that way it used to be where that guy had to really really work for everything he got and I'm not saying Johnny Davis didn't but Purdue generally did a pretty good job making that player at least inefficient and making other people beat them and that's what they've been absolutely unable to do here uh, in some of these games where they've struggled um, you know uh Expecting traditional kind of Purdue hallmarks or benchmarks or hallmark was probably the right word. Expecting those things from this team, 
you know, I think, you know, Purdue people have probably, including myself, because I've been watching this program for 20 some years, expecting this team to fall into that traditional Purdue blueprint, you know, maybe was a little bit ambitious because this is not a traditional Purdue team. Um, and I'm not saying that because of the performance, I'm saying that because of the composition. You know, over the last decade or so, decade might be a little bit too long of a window here. Over the last six, seven years, I feel like Matt Painter has really kind of evolved into more of an offensive-minded coach. And I know he has obviously put quite a premium on skill, quite a premium on scoring, you know, things like that. And this team is the product of, of that. This team, there are no Chris Kramers on this team. There are no Rafael Davises on this team, at least on the perimeter. I think Mason Gillis, uh, you know, can kind of be in that category uh, at some point if he's not already. But Painter used to really, really emphasize recruiting toughness, recruiting, you know, grit, kind of things like that. And as, you know, the program has sort of shifted toward needing to be able to pass and shoot and shoot threes and complement really good big guys, you know, that element has kind of been missing uh, to a certain extent. Obviously, going back to Rafael Davis, he was probably the last guy who I would consider being being part of that. Obviously, Dakota Mathias became a good player, a good defensive player, but I don't think anybody would view him as sort of that 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 sort of ultimate toughness guy. So Purdue, at its most basic levels, Purdue is not really built like a traditional Purdue team. Obviously, they're big and strong uh, on the interior should be much more physical than a lot of teams they play. I emphasize the should be because they weren't tonight. Um, but expecting Purdue to all of a sudden just become that team that is just you know a great defensive team that nobody wants to play against, that's not been Purdue's reality for a few years now. And that's you know something this team really has to grow into and really hasn't yet. And you know I, I, I remember going back to November and saying, when Purdue was absolutely rolling offensively, that this team is going to have to embrace defense. They're going to have to figure out some sort of identity from a defensive perspective. They're going to have to figure out a way to win the games that are 67 to 62 when you can't score 95 points on somebody. That is the very definition of Big Ten play. And it's just, it's not happened. And I, I wondered back then if things coming so easily for Purdue from an offensive perspective going back to the first three games of the year and then all the success they had in Connecticut, the Florida State game, I didn't feel like, like they played terribly well and they still scored a million points. Um, I kind of wondered if maybe that wasn't, you know, a little bit of a, a, little bit of a trap door in, in terms of giving Purdue maybe a false sense of security that they could just go out there and outscore everybody left on their schedule because through the first eight games of the year, that's exactly what they were doing. And maybe in those early season games in November uh, and into December when Purdue needed to be evolving into that team who could show out a lot better from a defensive perspective than they have through three Big Ten games, maybe they were able to just kind of roll the ball out there and score 100 points on everybody. And maybe that wasn't necessarily the best thing long term uh, for this team. I don't know. Again, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a mind reader. I'm just a guy who watches basketball and then talks into his computer afterwards about whatever half-assed theory uh, comes to mind. Um, so I don't know. But Purdue's got a lot of improvement left to do. Uh, as I said before, they were a great non-conference team, but they have not given you much reason yet to believe that they are a great Big Ten team at this point because Big Ten basketball and non-conference basketball are two very different things. Purdue was great at one, has not yet been great at another. Uh, there are some things here that really have to fall in, into place in a hurry here. Um, Purdue's one and two in the Big Ten, uh, talking about Big Ten titles at this point. It is such a long season. Ever Talking about Big Ten titles at this point in the year is always a fool's endeavor because it is such a long season. So many crazy things happen. And the league is going to be so balanced again. Um, but, you know, Purdue needs to focus on the day-to-day -day here. They need to come in 
to practice this week and really, really listen to Matt Painter and Paul Lusk at the defensive end of the floor, really buy into this thing. I know how Purdue teaches. I know I have a relatively good understanding of what Purdue teaches, and I know what I see on the floor is not what, what is being taught. I know that this team just does not look like it's progressing necessarily in the areas it needs to be progressing. All this being said, I know this sounds like fire and brimstone, and I'm sure the internet is fire and brimstone right now, but Purdue's still a good team. It just it just lost the game today, and it can't afford to lose very many more and still you know, compete for championships and compete for the sorts of seeds that it aspires to have here. But, you know, if you don't get better from this, where you need to get better, then you're not the team you think you are anyway because Purdue may not have it in it. So um, that's what I got here from Purdue's 74-69 to loss to Wisconsin. Long way to go here for Purdue. Um, so we'll be at Penn State this weekend seeing where they go from here. Um, and I will talk to you then from State College, Pennsylvania. So one more time from Mackey Arena, this is Brian Newbert from GoldenBlack.com. Thank you for watching. Thank you for reading. Thank you for listening. And thank you for processing our materials, however it is you process our materials. And thank you once again to the Pre Union Club Hotel and the 811 Restaurant. We appreciate your support. And uh, we will talk to you all again um, this weekend from Penn State. Thanks, everybody.